So um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, I just want to ask everybody to please refrain from using the chat function. It is not um, the proper method for a public comment. Um, public comments will be heard after um, the hearing for each individual hospital. Today is the final day of hearings and we're hearing from Northeastern Vermont and Northwestern. So um, with that, um, I guess, Sean, if you could introduce each of the people who are going to testify and then we'll ask Joanne to swear you all in. Sure, sounds good. You ready, Kevin? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I know we have a rather large team today here online, and uh, I think it's just emblematic of the uh, style of leadership we have uh, here at NVRH, but I'd like to introduce the leadership team. We have Sean Burroughs, my CIO, Betty Ann Guatkin, my uh, head of HR, Bob Hersey, um, our CFO, who should also be acknowledged as, I believe, the longest serving CFO of any hospital in the state of Vermont, uh, Laura Newell, uh, VP of Medical Practices, uh, Michael Roos, our CMO, <clears throat> Laura Ruggles, uh, VP of Community Health Improvement and Marketing, uh, Julie Schneckenberger, our Chief Nursing Officer, uh, Colleen Sinan, uh, VP of Quality Management, and of course myself as CEO of the hospital. Great, thank you, Sean. And if the board members could please introduce themselves. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. My name is Jessica Holmes, and um, I, when I'm not working at the board, I'm also teaching economics at Middlebury College, and I've been on the board six years. Hi, I'm Robin Lunch. I've been on the board for four years, and prior to this role, I worked in state government in various uh, health policy roles. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Tom Pelham, and uh, I've been on the board three years now in no, come, come November. I was uh, the former state uh, tax commissioner and former state finance commissioner under Howard Dean. Hi, I'm Maureen Yusufar. I've uh, been on the board a little over three years and prior to the board uh, was in corporate finance as CFO um, and also am on corporate uh, and public and private boards. Thanks. Great. So, Joanne, whenever you're Great. ready, if you could swear in um, everyone from Northeastern. Northeastern. Okay. If you would okay. all please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. We do. I do. Thank you. And if we could just ask anybody who is not presenting to mute themselves so we don't have any feedback, that would be great. And so, Sean, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Okay. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you want to kick off the presentation now and bring us to the introductions and overview screen. And while Bob's doing that, I'll just open with uh, saying that today, uh, what you're going to see is a budget that uh, demonstrates our ability to return to profitability. Uh, and we're looking to achieve a 2% operating margin as we come through uh, 2021. Uh, we uh, have assumed that there will be no additional pandemic related uh, in disruptions as we navigate this next year. Um, and, that's the big unknown. We are requesting uh, a 3.9% charge increase, but we feel it's justified given the uh, budget we have put forward. Uh, we also recognize that we're going to be continuing to deal with, uh, you know, the 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 impact of the pandemic as we navigate this this next year. And there are a number of expenses embedded in this budget that uh, have been driven by the pandemic. Uh, but we are going to also continue to focus on uh, avoidable ED visits, and you will hear uh, some additional uh, updates regarding our, our efforts in that space. Uh, our vision as a hospital is to be a leader in improving the health of the community. I also want to stress, uh, you know, like all hospitals, we've been deeply impacted by the pandemic, but I am so proud of the entire team here at NBRH, not just leadership, not just our physicians, but everyone 
throughout the entire organization who have really worked hard to uh, navigate the last six months and have put us in a, in a position that we feel we are well positioned to be successful coming into the 2021 budget. I also want to say that the challenges that we had before the pandemic are still with us. So recruiting and retaining the talented workforce we need to care for our population remains our number one challenge. And secondly, we're continued to be challenged navigating healthcare reform efforts while we care for an aging, more medically complex population here in the Northeast Kingdom. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to Laura Ruggles, who's gonna give us a walkthrough of many of our COVID related efforts and work with the community over the last uh, six months. Hi, good morning, Hi. everybody. We're on slide five. Uh, so I usually do an update on our work in the community during these hearings. And since that work is continuing and more important than ever during this pandemic, we're using part of our intro to talk about it. So it's slide five, Bob. Thank you. So those of you who know us know that our mission and our top priority is to improve the health of the people in the communities we serve. Uh, we feel it's our responsibility to be a leader and strong partner with others to meet that mission. And we are so fortunate to live and work here with so many strong community partners who really share that same commitment to community health. So we're all in this together. We've all heard that a lot lately. Um, and our many years of collaboration and building systems of care and our proven rec track record of working together, that real strong sense of stewardship here, that we really are all in this together, was never more needed than now. And the strong relationships that we have with our community partners have only grown stronger during this pandemic. So slide six. So our community partners reached out to us during this pandemic because they know that we'll be there for him and we were. So we've just got a few examples here. Um, you saw some on the other slide too, some community testimonials, um, whether it's sharing our COVID testing tent with the firm that so they can do testing or we moved Veggie Van Gogh, which is our partnership with the Vermont Food Bank outdoors so we could continue to feed over 300 families a month. Working with the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging to provide emergency food for seniors, or really something as basic as providing cleaning solution for our rural community part, transportation partners when they literally couldn't get cleaning solution from anywhere else. So we were here for them. So slide seven. So during the pandemic, we took our role as leaders in health very seriously. So even putting aside all the misinformation that was coming from the White House, it was really just this fast moving pandemic. It was hard for everyone to keep up with the rapidly changing data and information about COVID-19. So we were tried really hard to get ahead of the pack in re getting reliable information out to the public. We went on social media, front porch forum, print media, and on the radio with accurate information and simple information about simple information and messages about how to stay healthy and safe. So there's on the screen are two of the pieces that we created. These were print ads, but also posters, and we shared them with our local chambers of commerce and they distributed to their business members. And because we could be fast and flexible, we had these ready months before the state agencies were able to produce similar products for general use. Okay, slide eight, please. So this is just a few examples of our ongoing wear a mask social media campaign. Those are employees, employees that were doing their part as responsible citizens to keep everyone safe. Slide nine. So I've mentioned how we were here for our community and our community partners, but they were really here for us too, in large and small ways. And we are so grateful for that overwhelming support from our community members. We got lots and lots and lots of food 
We got donations of personal protection supplies and really simple thank yous like the ones that you see here. So the pandemic isn't over, but MVRH in our community is strong and we will endure and bounce back from COVID-19 better than ever. And thank you for your time this morning. Sorry, trying to find my own mute button. Bob is having a problem finding his own mute button. Um, Bob, are you able to find the mute button? I have a menu bar right on the lower part of the screen. I guess he's having trouble. Um, I'm going to run up to Bob's office and just see if I can help him unmute. <laughs> Chief Technology Officer. <laughs> you know, you got to do what you got to do in a small hospital. I I know, is, that, my mask. is that something Abigail can do? Mandy? Unfortunately, I'm not able to unmute people. You have to do it from your own screen. But um, Sean is right underneath. There's a taskbar and all the way to the left is turn camera on and off and then there's the mute button. Abigail, is it different if you're sharing your screen? Does no, it pop you up still the have the taskbar. Okay. It is a bit different if uh, you have the app downloaded. So my menu bar is on the upper right hand of my screen um, and I don't know when that changed. So yesterday when I muted myself, I was expecting it to be on the bottom and I didn't see it up top, but apparently that's changed in the last few days. Thank you. I just, I just texted Bob and Sean. Really? Maybe they'll can you hear me now? We yeah. can. All right, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, can you see the screen? Am I still sharing this, the uh, presentation now? No. no, we just see you, Bob. So okay, we'll have to, uh, All right. share. Well, uh, give me a second here. Let's see if I can do two things. Um, can you see the screen now? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Who was sharing it earlier? Me. Okay. Can you see it now? <laughs> no. No. Really? Now we can. Yeah, it's up. Okay. Oh, there we go. This is much more fun than doing this in person. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob, leave yourself right. unmuted for the rest of the duration, okay? All right. So, uh, I mean to be on slide 10. You're going the wrong way, Bob. Yep. Here we are. Okay, here we are, finally on slide 10. Thank you for your patience. No problem. So I'm going to start, uh, this is the income statement. I'm going to get into details on different aspects and components of the income statement. But I want to start by letting everybody know that the projection for 2020 that you see here is way off. Uh, we have completely redone the projections. These projections were done in May, uh, with May results, I should say. Uh, and our results for June and July were incredibly good. Um, for example, when we, we did the projections, I projected that the month of June would be about 75% of pre-COVID volumes and revenue, and the month of July would be about 80%. Both months were 100-something um, percent over our original projections and over our original budget. Um, so putting simply, the bottom line you see here, the negative 1,184,500,000 is now a positive $325,000. So um, I will touch on a few of those details, but I do really want to focus on the 2021 budget, but I just needed to update that. Unfortunately, we didn't get these reprojections done in time to include them in this presentation. Uh, moving on to 
slide 11. Um, just again, touching on the 2020 projections, we're now looking at 82.9 million of net patient revenue for um, this fiscal year. Looking at fiscal 2021 budgets, to 20 to 20, I'm sorry, 20 budget to 21 budgets, we're looking at about 3.7% growth in net patient revenue. Um, the guideline is 3.5%, but I need to point out that there is one drug that we're using for infusion patients um, that has a cost and revenue of $676,000. Um, I'll touch on that a bit more, but if you take the revenue associated with that one drug out, our budget to budget growth is 2.9%. We do have a little volume growth uh, into the budget. Our express care program, we've added a provider to, and we've also added a provider in our primary care practice. Um, the 3.9% charge increase, uh, the, the process we went through was we you know, projected our volume for 2021. Uh, we looked at cutting expenses where we could. We looked to maximize our other operating revenue. And we looked to see what we would need to close the gap and to cover the COVID-related expenses that we expect to continue into 2021. Um, so the number we needed to close the gap and get us to a 2% operating margin was the 3.9% charge increase that we're requesting. I'll elaborate on those in a bit more, starting with the charge increase request. Um, to close the gap that I discussed earlier to get us to the 2% margin, uh, we needed a rate increase of about 2.8%. However, we have about $415,000 of ongoing COVID-related expenses into next year. Uh, those expenses are for you know the increased costs for PPE, or personal protection equipment. Um, we have a testing facility off-site that we're using to do COVID testing. We expect to do that all year. Uh, and we're also going to do a flu clinic out of that site, I would add. Uh, and we have sentries, we call them, or people at the main entrances that screen every patient and visitor that comes into the hospital, um, ask them screening questions and uh, takes their temperature, et cetera, to make sure that uh, uh, we're not bringing anybody who might be infected with the virus into the hospital. Just to note down here, um, every 1% increase in our charges gets us $377,700 of, of net patient revenue. Moving on to slide 13. This is a trend of our um, rate increases, what we've requested and what we've been approved for over the past several fiscal years. Um, this year, again, we're looking for a 3.9% uh, rate increase. Um, last year, we asked for 3.5%, and you approved 3% increase for us. Moving on to slide 14, just to highlight some of our net patient I revenue. Don't, and, I don't think we're moving the slides. Are other people uh, getting the slides moved? There we go. Yeah, uh, they're moving for me. Is everybody got it now? Slide 15. What I'm seeing is NPR slash FPP revenue assumptions. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's where it should be on. Thank you. And it just um, got to there. We missed the other ones, but that's okay. We we have them. Okay. Uh, one of the major assumptions, key assumption, is that volume will return to pre-COVID levels. Mostly, there is still a small percentage of uh, patients who don't want to come into the hospital, uh, but that seems to be dwindling uh, right now. Um, we will continue to have telehealth visits uh, for some patients. There is a certain population that that still works for. Uh, we don't assume any pent up demand catch up. Um, we're back to normal operations in fiscal 21. Um, you know, not expanding operating hours. We're not expanding diagnostic imaging and testing uh, hours. So we're back to normal. Uh, again, we were sued that we'll get the 3.9% charge increase. Uh, we're not assuming any change to Medicare critical access payment rules. Uh, we do um, anticipate the sequestration will come back, the 2% Medicare reduction will come back January 1st. Uh, so we won't have the sequestration October to December, but we expect it to come back in January. 
And just as a side note, uh, that sequestration on an annual basis to us is about a $475,000 hit. We do not expect any uh, Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement rate changes. I believe that has been confirmed by DEVA at this point. Uh, we will participate in the One Care Medicaid Risk Program. We've built uh, about 600,000 reserve into the budget to participate in that. Uh, we are still not going to participate in any of the other risk models at this point. Um, to, you know, the 600,000 risk level we're willing to assume, um, but getting into the multi-million dollar risks associated with Medicare and, and the others is just not something that we feel is a critical access hospital uh, we can absorb. We do anticipate a slight decrease in our uncompensated care as a percent of gross revenue. Um, we've been projecting about three and three quarter percent of gross revenue uh, for uncompensated care. Again, that's uh, bad debts and, and free care or patient assistance. Uh, we're budgeting three and a half percent for fiscal 2021. And again, one of our key budget assumptions is um, the $676,000 drug for one patient, um, incredibly expensive. Fortunately, uh, insurance covers the cost of that medication, no more than cost, um, but we do get at least our cost back. Um, I would also point out that this is not a drug that's eligible for 340B. It's administered in an outpatient um, for a series of complex reasons. Uh, we are not, as a critical access hospital, not able to get that um, under the 340B program. Um, moving to the next slide, 15, it should be. Uh, again, because the projections for 2020 are so far off, a lot of this is not relevant anymore, but I do want to touch on a, a couple of the key highlights of the trend from fiscal 20 budget to fiscal 21 budget. Um, we're looking at the change, again, budget to budget, about 1,473,000 for rate increase, about 676,000 acuity, or that's that one drug, uh, about 100, I'm sorry, 1,225 for volume related. Um, and I wanna point out that of that volume, 750,000 is for COVID lab testing. Uh, we do a large volume of those lab tests, um, and the revenue associated with that is about $750,000. And we anticipate another 372,000 or so in other volume increases, again, some of it coming from our express care and additional primary care providers. Moving to slide 16, other operating revenue. Are the slides changing, by the way? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to touch on a couple of key points here under our op other operating revenue. Um, we're expecting to use about $4.3 million of stimulus support. That's a combination of federal and state stimulus support for COVID relief. Um, again, that covers lost revenues uh, during the pandemic period and some of our increased expenses. Um, the other key other operating expense, and you've probably heard this from a number of hospitals, is our 340B program. Um, that's for the retail, the other operating revenue side, that's about two and a half million dollars a year. I would point out that the 340B program does help us reduce our um, outpatient drug costs, and that right now is saving us another one and a half million dollars. So. In total, the 340B program is worth about $4 million to NVRH annually. Moving to uh, slide 17, um, I'm, I'm not going to actually touch on this one too much. Um, I, I will note that our projected expenses for 2020 did not change much. The changes were all on the revenue side. Our expenses are still on target. Uh, but I'm going to move to slide 18 and just talk about some of the trends from fiscal 20 budget to fiscal 21 budget. Um, again, looking at our starting revenue, of, uh, starting expenses of 90,308,000. The, um, the drug cost, again, 676,000 as a driver. Uh, COVID-related expenses, uh, 1,137,000. Salary increases and inflationary increases in total, about 1.7 million. Um, 
our inflation assumptions overall were in the two and three quarter to three percent range. Um, some are going up higher, obviously. Our PPE, again, personal protection equipment expenses are going up higher than that. Uh, drugs, we're projecting about a three and a quarter percent increase uh, for the drugs that we have here. Our, our health insurance is going to go up by more than that, uh, two, and a, two and three quarter to three uh, percent. But everything else, again, we're looking overall at about two and three quarters to, to three percent as our inflation rate uh, for the year. Um, our travel expenses, uh, an increase of 435,000 budget to budget, or our total travel expense budget for the year is 1.6 million. Uh, we're making all several efforts to reduce travelers. Uh, one of our efforts is to hire travelers. We've had a few travelers come work here. They like it here, we like them, uh, and we're hiring them. In fact, I think we just yesterday hired a traveler in our ED to become a permanent employee in the ED. And we're looking at other uh, wage and compensation packages that will entice employees uh, to come here and fill some of the vacancies that we're now using travelers for. And one of the other programs that we're looking at has helped us in the past and hoping to help us in the future is to um, hire some of the VTC grads uh, when they're done their school year. Uh, MRI and lease service is a new expense of $250,000 that was part of our certificate of need approval and that's right in line with that. Um, some changes to the hospital service. Uh, the cost savings, um, $625,000. Uh, that is uh, made up of a couple things. One is a ten, uh, reduction of 10 FTEs on a budget to budget basis. Um, We've also maximized the 340B savings. I said that's up to about a million and a half now. We're working on a supply chain to reduce some of the expenses for uh, joint replacements in particular. Um, we do a lot of joint replacements here. The prosthetics are expensive and we're working to reduce those costs. Um, I will add while I'm talking about joint replacements, so one of the savings that's not identified here but is, is, is happening is most all of our total joint replacements are done on an outpatient basis. The patients go home either the same day or the next day. So, you know what, having that long length of stay that used to be associated with the uh, total joint replacements, which is overall a cost savings as well. Uh, in depreciation expense, we have scaled back our capital spending program uh, in the savings for depreciation on a budget to budget basis is about $850,000. We'll talk about our capital spending a, a bit more uh, in a few minutes. Moving to slide 19, um, this is a trend of our operating margin. Um, just want to highlight here that that fiscal 2020 budget operating margin down in the, the red area, the negative area, is now a positive about 0.4% at about $325,000. So. Um, a couple other comments. If you look for fiscal 17 to fiscal 21, our average operating margin is now 1.6%. That's been updated again because of the new projection. Um, so that uh, again overall is about 1.6%. Um, we're in, before the pandemic hit, we were in, in pretty good financial health. Um, we were able to position ourselves if needed to actually even lose up to $2 million. At this point, I just want to stop and acknowledge the board's role in, in that. Um, you know, a few times in the past several years, our community has asked us to expand essential services. And in doing so, that meant we had to go beyond the 3.5% revenue cap guideline uh, that was in place. And so we presented our argument to you folks. You listened to us. Uh, you trusted we'd do the right thing, and, and we delivered in our community and our financial health benefited from that. You saw some of the earlier slides, the community's response. Um, our reputation has grown tremendously in, in the past several years. And, uh, and part of that is, is the expansion of those uh, services that you've allowed us to do. Um, 2% operating margin, again, that's what we targeted for this year, and that's what we feel is really minimally needed. Um, we're getting music from uh, someone, um, so perhaps people could mute their mics if they're not talking.
All of our representatives like are assisting other callers at this time. Like your call is very someone important called to in us. on the phone. Please who stay on the line and your call will you. be handled in the order it was received. I don't know if there's a way, Abigail, for you to mute someone or um, or disconnect that line. So I can mute the entire audience, but it will mute everyone. So you'd all have to unmute yourselves. And I know Jess would have to call out and come back in. So we can do that. You gotta I think you're going to have to. All right. Bob, well, can, you think oh. you can figure out how to unmute yourself again? Do you want I, me to I, I think so. We'll have All to right. wait for Jess anyways. So All we'll of our representatives are assisting other callers at this time. Can you hear me? Yep, we got yes, you, Bob. Can. Perfect. Thank you, Abigail. Jessica, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? I can yes. Back in. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, Is everybody back? Set, um, Continue and wait another minute or so. I think we're all set. Okay, great. So let's see, I was on the operating margin of slide 20 just at the bottom. I'm not sure if everybody heard, but 2% uh, uh, operating margin each year is what we really feel is needed to support um, our ED project, other capital projects, uh, as well as you know staffing and, and being able to keep giving our staff increases uh, to recruit, recruit and retain uh, and invest in, in new technology. Uh, <clears throat> moving to slide 20. Twenty-one. <laughs> I am still sharing the slides, right? Yes. Yeah, it hasn't jumped though yet, Bob. It's still on slide 20. Should be able to just hit your down arrow on your keyboard. Yep, I know. <laughs> but not working? I, I, yeah, no, I've been doing it for... But I don't know why it froze. There we go. Up oh, there we go. You jumped it now. You're on 22, but uh, okay. Yeah, I have to do. I have to do the cursor. So um, I'm on slide 21 now. Um, I think actually I'm going to move to slide 22. There's nothing here I really want to highlight at this point anyway. So. Um, Some of the, the comments on the balance sheet that I want to make, um, you know, we're rebuilding the balance sheet. We're not taking as big a hit as we thought, but we're still not going to achieve the budget operating margin for fiscal 20 that we had anticipated. Um, so we do need to build the balance sheet and it, for, to invest in, in future projects. Um, and especially those projects that have been delayed. Again, we kind of scaled back our capital program and we need to build the cash back up to get that program back online. Our capital debt structure ratios are good. Um, again, we're focused on a new ED expansion project in the future. Uh, maintaining that debt capacity is going to be key to us being able to issue some new debt to finance that project. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I'd here I'd, I'd highlight too is the DSC, DSCR, the debt service coverage ratio. At one point, it appeared that we were going to be in violation of our bond covenant which requires a certain level of debt service coverage. Um, I'm happy to report that with the new projections, that uh, is not going to be the case and we will be in compliance with all the bond covenants. Um, we did take advantage of the IRS's uh, option to delay FICA payments. So we delayed about 1.9 million of FICA payments as part of our, our cash preservation plan when the COVID hit. Um, and those don't have to be repaid completely until December of 2022. Uh, cash flow, is everybody seeing that now? Slide 23? Yes, yep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the other thing I wanna highlight here is that uh, that's likely to be about one and a half million dollars higher. So the two year projected cash, cash growth um, with the reprojection is gonna be somewhere in the $3.7 million range, uh, projected increase over those two years. A 
COVID related. Um, <clears throat> Well, I guess what I'll highlight here is that the money that we took in COVID, about 7.3 million in total, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're not going to need all of that based on our reprojections. And it's possible that we're going to have to repay uh, some of those grant funds to um, either HHS uh, or other organizations that gave us those advances. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one thing I will highlight, and we've had that money in the bank now for quite some time, and we've been earning you know, about $6,000 a month in interest on, on those funds, which, you know, it's, we're a small hospital. Every penny counts. Uh, next slide, the comments on the cash flow. Again, this is uh, steps we took to preserve cash. Um, our cash preservation policy that was put in almost immediately after the pandemic hit uh, allowed us to preserve about $7 million uh, in total. We prepared for the worst, and I'm happy to report that that didn't happen. Adjustments. Um, <clears throat> the, the comment here is that we may transfer a, a, a community-based practice to a hospital-based practice. That is looking more and more likely that it'll, it'll occur. Uh, we have an ophthalmologist in the community who uh, were looking to be employed by us uh, sometime after the first of the year. We're doing that in collaboration with Littleton Regional Hospital. So although he would be our employee, uh, we will share that uh, ophthalmologist with Littleton Regional Hospital. And we're also looking to recruit another ophthalmologist uh, that we would share with uh, North Country Hospital. So we're looking basically to have two ophthalmologists covering uh, three hospitals in collaboration with uh, NVRH. <clears throat> there were no adjustments or any accounting changes to report. Uh, on the so, so, some of you may recall that our local ophthalmologist was unable to practice for many months over the past year and it left a huge gap of ca in care for our communities. So trying to make <clears throat> that collaboratively with our partners is, is, is really important right now. And we'll be coming to the, to the Green Mountain Care Board, assuming this happens, which it looks like it will, uh, to ask for a, a transfer on for the, the revenue uh, associated with that practice. Uh, service line adjustments, uh, we don't uh, have any, I'm sorry, I'm on 27 now. Uh, we don't anticipate any service line adjustments as it says here, what we're um, offering is, is good. Um, I, I will say we're also collaborating with North Country Hospital uh, to have an express care. In addition to our express care at our corner medical location, we're collaborating with North Northern County's Healthcare uh, to put an express care in downtown St. Johnsbury. Uh, that is underway, and I believe the target date for that is uh, late December or early January. Yeah, the lease on the facility has been signed uh, by Northern Counties. We're working with them on building out the space, and that gets at some of the work we're doing to uh, continue to reduce, uh, um, you know, the unnecessary ED visits. So I'm going to stop and pause for a while and let a few other members of the team um, have a few words. Just a few words. I think we did ask uh, Dr. Bruce. Yeah. 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 So can everybody hear me okay? We can. Um, we can. All right. Um, so I was tasked with uh, exploring some of the risks that we see coming, and I think a lot of these will be familiar to you. Um, the um, staffing, meeting staffing needs in the near future is obviously on a lot of people's mind. Um, we did a uh, hazard um, um, assessment and uh, of our employees, and you know the whole idea of going back to school and having pods quarantining and what that was going to do to our staffing is heavily on the minds of our employees. So how we're going to how how families are going to balance teaching at home, work schedules, uh, various school schedules, uh, we're still trying to work through that, and I think the whole state is. Um, and then the use of travelers we talked about. Um, we've been pretty successful in um, trying to reduce the use of travelers as much as possible, recognizing that that is a real heavy expense for us. Um, so we try to avoid locum tenens and travels, travelers as much as possible. Um, we are worried about another surge. 
um, and the effect that that could have on us if we have to shut down services. Um, that was obviously devastating to us like it was for everybody else. Um, we got back up and running as quickly as the state allowed us to, and um, that has been part of our success, actually. Um, so we're, we're hoping um, that we continue to do as well as we have as far as avoiding a surge. And I really credit Vermonters and uh, people complying with our uh, PPE and uh, hygiene requests, and I think we're very good at doing that, and I think uh, that's part of our success, actually. Um, we're worried about recruiting and retaining key staff. Um, we had 19 nursing positions vacant before the pandemic, um, and uh, uh, we have been fairly successful in filling those positions. Um, I think working with the schools and recruiting nurses coming out um, as new grads has worked, um, but we still need to keep our salaries competitive or we will lose nurses to a more competitive environment. So we are actively looking at the market and trying to keep our salary and fringe as competitive as possible. We do not want to lose our good nurses um, strictly on the basis of, uh, you know, a few um, dollars an hour difference just down the road. Uh, the One Care uh, Medicaid program is a risk. Uh, at one point, we were suffering some pretty hefty losses in that program. That has since turned itself around a bit, and we're projecting to do a little better this coming year. So um, while it is a risk, um, we feel we practice under the guidelines, and uh, we're well positioned to do well under um, accountable care. So um, we're hoping while that is a risk, we, we also uh, look at it as a potential opportunity. Um, Bob mentioned um, capital. Um, you know, if we, um, we have a nine room emergency room, um, I hope um, each of you get a chance to vi visit and see what it looks like. It is extremely crowded and um, add to that in a pandemic experience. And uh, we have curtains trying to divide respiratory and non-respiratory patients. These are undifferentiated patients coming into the emergency room. It is a risky environment, and um, we need a modern emergency room to sufficiently care for our patients, and uh, we need to keep working toward that. So that is something that we need to make sure we can, um, we have sufficient capital to do that. Without that, I, I really fear that, uh, you know, we could have problems down the road. Um, yeah, I want to but Mike, I just want to add to that briefly because uh, we knew we had, were challenged in our emergency department uh, prior to the uh, pandemic hitting. And the pandemic really highlighted just uh, what the challenges look like uh, in that space. Not only was it dealing with uh, people coming in with uh, respiratory issues and how to protect them from uh, other patients who might be experiencing trauma or another event, but also uh, we have seen a real uh, uptick in the number of people presenting with mental health in mental health crisis. And I think that is also a factor of the pandemic. Yeah. So dealing with those two challenges in a space that is just not well designed for it um, has been very hard. You know, it's very much our front door and uh, we need to be able to get patients. That's where most of our inpatients come from is through the emergency room. And I do wanna correct myself. I, I, I would like you to visit our emergency room, but not as a patient. So just as a uh, out of interest, okay? Um, so, um, and then we need to be able to um, deal with the long-term economic impact in our community. Laurel uh, Ruggles pointed out, you know, what we do for our community here. Um, NVRH is a major player um, in our community with uh, Northeast Kingdom Prosper, um, and what we do in this community. And uh, without a strong hospital, um, a lot of these efforts are just gonna falter. So we really wanna be able to um, play a major role in that uh, economic um, impact. Again, I'm sorry, but uh, Mike, let me just add one more thing around that. I I'd just like to give the uh, board an example of what we're facing. So we have a seasonal warming shelter here that uh, in a typical year, would serve on any night between six and 10 uh, people who were homeless. When the pandemic hit, the number of homeless people that needed to be served in this community skyrocketed to over 100. 
many of them families. And and so that's an example of where many of these people may have been cohorted with, with uh, friends or finding, patching their housing solution together, but then found themselves uh, um, not able to take advantage of those relationships uh, because of the pandemic and suddenly the needs jumped up significantly. We saw similar uh, impacts with uh, um, access to food. So those are all the uh, challenges that our community looks to our support and leadership in helping solve. Yeah, our uh, veggie Van Gogh um, food distribution has been extremely crowded. Cars uh, lined up around the block here to get, it, to get um, the free food distribution that we do once a month. Um, and then the last thing is our supply chain. And again, you probably heard this over and over, but um, our inability to procure sufficient quantities of PPE, now reagents to run tests, the whole supply chain is up in the air. Um, you know, being able to do in-house testing for COVID is becoming essential to be able to adequately move our patients through um, our hospital um, to do procedures on them. Um, to deliver their babies. Um, you know, the fact that we um, were, were behind the curve on that where we have to send all of our labs out. And uh, so we're, um, these are things that um, need to improve. So we need to be in a good position to be able to provide all of this, uh, uh, all of these services. That's it, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Great. Opportunities, Laura Newell, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. I guess a fun job of talking about all of our opportunities. Um, as you read through the high level bullet points here, you can see that in addition to all the risks that Dr. Bruce was speaking of, we actually do have a lot to be excited about. Um, this, the pandemic, along with our historically solid foundation, has really provided us with many opportunities. Um, as some of my team members alluded to and spoke about, um, NBRH's leadership and guidance during this uncertain time has really cemented our remarkable reputation within the community. And this in turn with years of steadfast innovation, innovative approach um, has really offered us the ability to strengthen our current partnerships, as well as work with new partners on a number of exciting uh, in, uh, initiatives. The hospital was also able to use a time when things were moving so quickly and changing so rapidly to really take a step back and pause and reflect on some operational inefficiencies and do a reset. Um, we found new ways to leverage data um, and uh, platforms like the One Care Vermont um, data uh, analytics. Um, as well as um, looking at changing workflows to better meet our community's needs. Um, you know, all in all, we've all the challenges that we've faced have really afforded us the opportunity to look at things with a new and fresh perspective. And we really do have a lot to look forward to in our upcoming fiscal year. Um, things like uh, partnering with our local education centers like VTC and NVU on training future healthcare workers. Um, and getting them right into work after graduation. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah, let me just add uh, or expound on that. I think one observation I've made over the last six months is that um, we've always excelled at developing strong partnerships and relationships within our community and the larger healthcare uh, environment here in the Northeast Kingdom, North Country. And I think one thing that I've observed is that uh, we've been able to really leverage those relationships and continue to strengthen them so that uh, we can you know, meet the healthcare needs of our community. An example is uh, ophthalmology, working with Littleton Regional Hospital, as well as North Country Hospital, explore how we uh, meet those needs here. Bob, I think it's back to you with uh, the capital budget plans. Yep. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, a couple minutes here on the capital budget plans. As, as I've said probably a few times now, we had to scale back our, our capital spending um, when the pandemic hit. Um, one project we did have to go forward with was replacing all of our information system servers. 
Um, they're all linked to our electronic health records. We're all on electronic health records, so we cannot risk losing those servers and access to our EHR. Uh, the good news is we were able to secure great uh, financing uh, for that project, um, interest-free financing, specifically for over 42 months. Um, so we had to do it, but we found a good way to, to finance it. Um, and you've heard about our ED projects now. We're going to start the planning process again. That was The planning process was put on hold after the pandemic hit, um, and we're going to start that process back up during fiscal 21. Uh, and at some point, most likely in fiscal 22, uh, you will be seeing a certificate of need application from us for that project. So that concludes our presentation. Yeah, let me well, just. Sean, uh, you have any closing comments? Yeah, I just want to uh, say that um, again, it has been incredibly challenging to go through this process. Uh, the future feels opaque, and I also want to thank uh, the members of the Green Mountain Care Board for your flexibility, supporting all of us through this, and uh, really. Um, helping us get through the budgeting process in a way that still feels meaningful uh, to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So we're gonna start with board member questions and we're gonna start with board member Holmes, Jessica. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sure. perfect. Yep. <laughs> um, well, thank you for your thanks and I'd like to return the favor and also thank you. Um, and your leadership team and all your dedicated staff for all the efforts you underwent during this pandemic. Uh, it's, you know, times like this in the last six months where I'm really grateful to live in Vermont where we have hospital leaders and community members and healthcare workers that really do um, put mission first and are dedicated to serving their communities. So thank you for that. Um, also, thank you for the budget submission. I really appreciated having read them all multiple times now. I really appreciated the attempt to create an easy to follow breakdown of expenses and revenues and the bridge table and the narrative was really helpful to me. So Bob, if that's your fancy work there, it was very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was really helpful. Um, so let me just, I'm, I want to start with some of the volume assumptions and I'm trying to understand every hospital's volume assumptions, particularly for 2021, realizing full well that creating a budget in this time of uncertainty is, you know, it is what it is. You're doing the best that you can. We're all doing the best we can to, 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 to predict the future. We don't have crystal balls. Um, but, but the original submission had a $7.1 million decline in volume in 2020 and an assumed $6.5 million return. So my my original assumption was, oh, that's about, you're kind of assuming about a 90% return um, to pre-COVID levels. Is that right? Are you on the same page with me? Pretty much, uh, yeah. No, pretty, okay. uh, pretty much was the assumption at the time. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. so now hearing your, uh, so 90% was sort of at the time of submitting the budget. Understandably, you've had new information, June and July being over 100%. Maybe some of that's a little pent up demand, but at least it's over 100%, which is great. I'm really happy to see your bottom line returning and, and things are looking up financially. So now I'm wondering, um, are you underestimating, you know, is it going to be 90% next year? Or are you more likely to see that full $7.1 million return or even maybe more and should that NPR assumption be updated given the June and July results? Yeah, that's certainly something we're, we're looking at, Jessica. You know, I'm, I'm really not ready to go there yet, but okay. um, we, we're still monitoring and we'll continue to monitor. And if we find that we're, you know, as we get into the year a few months, we find that our volume assumptions are off significantly, we'll, we'll come back and let you folks know. Okay, and so then let me, as a follow-up, that if there is more utilization than anticipated, therefore more revenue, of course, also more expense, um, but is there less needed to close the gap? And would you also want to adjust the charge request? Uh, again, that would be part of what we monitor and, and reproject. And yeah, if we're seeing more volume, uh, it's you know enough that we could reduce the rates and we'd come back to you folks uh, mid-year or, or after the first quarter probably uh, and, and let you know. Okay. I think, um, Jessica, yeah. one thing that, you know, what I've described is there, that in my mind, uh, over the last several months, I've said there are three key markers that will give us a better sense of the progression of the pandemic. 
One was the summer and what happened over the summer, and we didn't see a massive surge here. The second uh, one, we're in the middle of right now, which is really kids returning to school, uh, kids coming back from college. So far, I'm gonna knock on wood, uh, that seems to be going well. There's one third, in my mind, final uh, one, which is what happens as we come into November, December, flu season, people coming back indoors. And, and does that uh, generate a resurgence uh, of COVID and a reluctance for people to then engage with healthcare, et cetera? And I think we really need to get through that third and final event uh, to get a true sense of what's going to happen with volume. Okay. Yeah, completely understandable. I mean, I literally believe none of us have a crystal ball. And, uh, you know, so everybody is, you know, we've got this target and we're all trying to shoot for it, but. Like a lot, not a lot of information, a lot of ambiguity. So I'm just trying to understand everybody's yep. assumptions. You've got a good grasp on it. <laughs> um, so let me ask you one more question about the rate request. Um, in the narrative, you break down the rate request, and it's a 2% normal closing of the gap, and then a 1.9% COVID-related adjustment. And you actually break down the COVID expenses there in the narrative, 114,000 for screeners, 376,000 for uh, the testing tent and PPE of 200,000. So it's roughly about 700,000. Yep. Um, but then in the presentation, you have only a 1.1% adjustment yep. for COVID expenses down to 400,000. So your incremental COVID expenses drop from the narrative of 700 down to 415. So I guess I'm just curious, why wouldn't the COVID component drop from you know 1.1 to 1 1.9 to 1.1 but you still keep the two percent normal the same so you know i mean I'm, I'm just trying to understand what happened between the narrative and the I mean, just you know again better data you know as, as we solidified some of our planning around the, the security uh, entrances um and the t testing tent uh, one of the things we did differently was i, I believe the original projection was to have a screener uh, at the employee entrance. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we've done instead is we purchased some thermal scanners. And so yeah. employees come in, they badge in, and they have the temperature taken at a kiosk. Uh, right. So that eliminated the need for a position. I mean, that's one change. I mean, it doesn't account for the entire difference, but that's an example of things that changed from our original projections and plans to today. So I guess what I'm, guess I'm trying to understand is why did the 3.9 rate request stay the same? If the expenses associated with COVID dropped, why wouldn't the rate request dropped at the same level? Why um, would 3.1 now instead of 3.9? Yeah, if, yeah, if just other, other, other factors that, that, that changed as well. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, we needed 3.9 um, to get us to the 2% operating margin after everything was, was we looked at. Okay. Um, you also mentioned in here the 597 um, in the 2021 budget for stimulus support, but I know you weren't applying for at least that it sounded like in the submission you aren't applying for provider stabilization funds from the state. So I'm wondering what is the source of that 597 in the 2021 budget? For sure. Stimulus? Yeah, we've, we've already got the money. We've got uh, about $7.3 so, million dollars has been received. Okay. Uh, we're going to take some of that into income in 2020 and some in 2021. So oh, okay. the, so the money is here. Over. I'm sorry. It's a carryover. It's not new funding that you're. Supposed exactly. To. Yeah. No, oh. the, the money is the money is already here. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I thought it was new money, and I was trying to understand the source for that. No. Um, yeah. And uh, no, zero dollars budgeted for non-operating revenue. Can you just talk right. about that? Sure. Most of our non-operating revenue, almost all of it, actually. Uh, has to do with fluctuations in the stock market or in financial markets, the realized and unrealized gains on our investments. And um, you know, I, I just don't take a stab at that. My crystal ball for that has never been good. <laughs> if it was good, we'd all be rich, right? I would certainly not be doing this. I am not, this, this isn't fun. I mean, I love this, but uh, you know, I could think of other things to do if I you know, hit the stock market right every time. Okay, well, I mean, I just noticed a lot of other hospitals are projecting 2%, 3%, 4% return on their investments. And so your your decision is to project 0% or zero growth in. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, again, I, I don't know where it's going. I guess okay. maybe they have better crystal balls than I do, but I, I just don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Um, 
And I guess my final last question is you mentioned, not you, Bob, um, can't remember if it was uh, one of the other speakers mentioned an improvement in One Care Vermont performance um, for this year. And I'm just wondering what lessons uh, potentially could have been learned for that improvement in, in performance and why going forward you're more optimistic about the ability to um, meet the targets and perform well in that uh, ACO model. Sure. Sean, maybe that's, I don't know, that's yeah, you. I'm, I'm that's, just... I'd be happy to take that. You know, um, I think p part of it is uh, increasing comfort level and understanding of the model. It's, it's, it's a massive change and it, um, and it has taken us time to really uh, adapt to it, number one. Number two, uh, you know, our first first year of participation was not good, and it appears that the, that the, the target spend was was probably miscalculated somewhere in, in, in the system, right? And, and so the entire system has, has lost a lot of money in the Medicaid risk track. Um, despite that, we, we've done, we've lost money, but we're doing okay, uh, it looks like, for that year. But this year, of course, the big advantage is that um, as the pandemic hit and, uh, and our uh, visits dropped off, you know, we still, as part of that model, were receiving those consistent checks month to month. And so that provided a level of stability that that, that frankly helped us navigate the uh, the financial crisis that we found ourselves in starting in uh, mid March. Um, and I think if we can continue to build a strategy, work collaboratively with One Care, try to narrow the risk quarter for the small hospitals because that's the biggest challenge, right? It's 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 what does it look like in those wild swings? Um, um, can we? Can we? Sorry, I'm getting sorry, a little I'm feedback. Getting stand that uh, but can, <laughs> can we build on build on that experience and, and, and provide a strategy that uh, provides some stability for hospitals while uh, trying to mitigate the risk as much as possible and and, and I'm optimistic I, I think we continue to learn a lot through the program and, and and that's a good thing and so and you're aware that the Medicare risk corridors have been reduced for next year I do, but the, the numbers are still uh, significant. Okay. All right, that is it for me. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you thank all. Thank you, Jessica. Next will thank be you. board member Lunch, Robin. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And I just wanted to echo Jess's thanks for the work of you and your staff uh, during the pandemic. Um, we're, we know everyone's been straight out, and we appreciate all of your um, efforts during this unprecedented time. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, one of the, the positions that you talked about uh, potentially coming back online was an audiologist. Um, and I assume that's because of a vacancy, but I'm, I apologize that I don't remember from last year what you told us about the audiologist. So could you just give us a little more background? Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, the, oh, good. Laura, you get that? Oh, sure. Laura's I'm happy got to talk that. about Go that. Ahead. Go ahead. Um, we had an audiologist that moved out of the area um, a little over a year ago. Um, so we've been without an audiologist. Um, actually, we've been partnering with Littleton Regional Hospital and utilizing some of their services um, until we could find a permanent replacement. Um, and we've been able to do that, uh, which is great. And she actually starts next week. So we're very excited about that. Great, thank you. Um, you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your staffing. You mentioned that reduction in 10 FTEs and in your narrative talked a little bit about some folks having reduced hours. Um, did you have to do full-blown furloughs during the pandemic? Um, could you talk a little bit more about that, whether if so, are those folks back um, and then uh, if you have a wage increase budgeted for fiscal year 2021, what is that for just for, for comparison purposes with other hospitals? Sure. Betty Ann, do you Betty want to uh, give that update? Uh, sure. Uh, we did have uh, people furlough um, and we uh, did it on a voluntary basis. <clears throat> um, so what happened was um, 
people uh, volunteered to furlough um, in the heat of COVID when um, when we were not providing services. Um, the um, so then the employee had to uh, request the furlough from the manager just to make sure um, that we didn't need them. Uh, so we had um, a lot of people doing that. Um, and then some people uh, were on like a partial furlough. So they were working some and then they were also home some. But uh, everybody is back um, from the furloughs and uh, they started uh, they started coming back gradually, but everybody is back now. Um, we did do um, an early retirement package, um, and we offered that um, to 39 people, and it was for um, people who were age 65 and over and had been here at least 15 years. And we had to, when you do an early retirement package, you have to offer it to everyone in that category. And so we did that, and we had uh, 22 people take the early retirement package. Thank you. And my last question was about the budgeted fiscal year 21 wage increase. Oh, right. Bob, do you want to share what yep. we budgeted? So uh, we have assumed a 3% uh, average increase um, that will include some market adjustments as needed to keep competitive and ever-changing and challenging uh, market labor pool. Great, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for providing uh, information about the travelers and how that's been going and your efforts to reduce travelers. Um, I was wondering if you could expound a little bit more on what areas you tend to need travelers. Um, we've heard, for example, from other hospitals, OR is a big area, um, as well as if you know the number of FTEs, um, uh, I think those were my only other questions related to travelers. Sure, yep. Julie, do you want to touch on that? Uh, sure, hi. Um, so we have uh, about eight travelers in um, in place right now. Uh, we've have had difficulties for the ICU, med surge, and predominantly the emergency department. We have been able to retain our staff in the OR, um, which is is great. So that those are the areas that we are struggling with. And we've remarkably had trouble recruiting travelers. Um, it's not usually as hard as it has been the last few months to get travelers here. And that's well, I just imagine in, in COVID nursing. does not help with that either. <laughs> no, and some of the southern states that were uh, offering huge amounts of money for people to come and work, first New York, and then down in the south, Texas, and, and Florida, and places like that, uh, huge amounts of money for people to come and work there. So I think that was a little more enticing um, for the brave ones that wanted to jump into that. So. But those are the nursing positions that we have travelers for. Great. Um, do you have other areas where you tend to need a lot of contract labor? We have heard some around t different kinds of tech. We've had uh, lab tech uh, travelers at one point. Uh oh, Bob. Oh, Bob froze. Yeah. Yeah, so Bob's right. Lab tech, um, that's probably the other big one. Um, obviously, it's, it's nursing is a real pain point. In general, though, you know, we're tight labor wise across the board, you know, whether it's diagnostic imaging, whether it's lab tech, whether it's respiratory therapy, all those, you know, allied health uh, roles are, are still are tough to recruit for here. Thank you. Um, and then my last question relates to telehealth. Um, you mentioned um, that you're expecting some continued telehealth. I wondered if you could give us a sense of at one point, um, how much telehealth were you doing? Where, how has it declined? What do you see as some of the su successes or challenges around telehealth? Sure, we pulled together some numbers and Laura's gonna walk you through that. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Thanks for the question. Um, I'd say that at the height of our uh, at the height of the pandemic um, back in April, there's probably about um, 
an 80% utilization of telehealth. Um, right now we're down to about 5%, and I think that will stay pretty consistent. Um, patients are actually really wanting to come in and see their providers, um, but there are definitely certain visit types and such that really lend themselves well to telehealth, and, and those services are continuing in that. Um, certainly the challenges are our area and our ruralness. Um, so broadband, um, I think Caledonia County is about 20% underserved right now. Um, and then also the um, demographics of our health service area as well. Um, but patients and providers alike have really, I mean, we we implemented telehose or telehealth through a water hose, right? Um, through a fire hose, rather. Uh, so um, people picked up on it really quickly and really embraced it since it was kind of the only option there for a little while. And I and I know uh, oftentimes when you think telehealth, you think you know uh, connecting over video with a patient, but um, a large number of those visits continue to be telephonic. And, and, and I think we should recognize that as well. You know, for uh, many of our patients, that's still the most comfortable way to connect if they're not coming and showing up in person. That's interesting, yeah. And I was curious, uh, the 5% is the lowest we've heard so far in terms of what people are expecting for a steady state. Would you attribute that to either the types of services that you provide? Obviously, there's probably a lot more telehealth than uh, primary care, for example, and you have a strong FQHC network. Um, but uh, would, what would you attribute that to? The 5% compared to other folks are anywhere, I think the second lowest we heard was 10% and most people seem to be around 30%. Mm -hmm. I would really say patient preference. Um, they're really preferring to come, come into the office versus um, utilize the telehealth service. Um, we're certainly still offering it where it's appropriate. Um, for example, psychiatry is still 100% telehealth. All of our behavioral health visits are still um, utilizing telehealth. Um, and then, you know, some of the follow-up type appointments too, we're utilizing telehealth. Um, but the option is still out there for patients, but many of them are opting to come into the office and see their providers. Uh, I, I would also be remiss in, in, in mentioning, I know Bob is probably desperately trying to reconnect right now, but um, I believe the enhanced reimbursement for rural health centers in telehealth uh, will be expiring later this fall. Yeah. And so we've got to keep our eye on that and uh, that national stage and see what happens in terms of the el evolution of reimbursement for telehealth services. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm sorry. I. Um... I'm in Laura's office now. My <laughs> no box. worries. You know, if you had the overhead and transparencies, I'd be great. <laughs> You're doing great, Bob. Don't worry about it. Um, great. Well, that's that's uh, interesting. I appreciate your observations because I think in the rural areas, it's hard to tease out with the telehealth how much is broadband the issue, which would, you know, I think drive more people to come in versus the travel time, which you'd think would drive more people to want to do telehealth. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the winter when travel is uh, more challenging as well. But that was my last yep. question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Next, we're going to move to board member Pelham. Tom? Thank you. Um, I also want to add my applause to uh, the fact that you've, you're have you certainly well-grounded as a uh, stable force in your community and that serves the people that you serve well and i think it will serve you as an institution uh in the long run well that people just think that you're there and you're rock solid and and it's uh, an embedded part of the community so that's a hard thing to build and so congratulations on doing that um my first question has to do with the um grant funds and so uh, you can see on the income statement <clears throat> the 7.19 million dollars in use of grant funds in, in 2020 and the 597,000 in 2021. Those two combined add up to 7.78 million dollars. But then on your um, 
your uh, revenue replacement funds sheet, um, you only show um, an amount of $7.39 million being uh, um, not having to be repaid. And so there's a delta there about $400,000. And I'm just wondering uh, what your thinking is on, is on that. Sure. So um, actually, my thinking is completely different now. Um, because of our volumes coming back, we're not going to need all of the COVID funds that we've received. Um, I'm actually looking, if things, unless things change, having to actually repay some of the money that we've received. So um, the, the flow of those COVID funds has changed completely. So what I'm thinking right now is that in total, we'll use about $4.3 million of the money we've received thus far. I mean, some hospitals are saying that they, that they don't want to commit at all because they're afraid of audits, uh, you know, of these funds relative to the regulations. And so they're kind of keeping some tucked away to uh, um, in, in, in case there is an audit finding. Right. So um, there's definitely going to be, well, I shouldn't say definitely, as it stands right now, um, because we've received more than 750,000 of federal grant funds, which these are considered, uh, we will have to go through a, a single audit for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's um, the, you know, so we've got the money. We've we've got the money. Um, it's just I'm not sure we're going to be able to justify all of it when this is all. Yep. But you're earning interest on it. Yeah, six thousand a month. That's, <laughs> that's not bad. Good going. Um, on the provider tax, I noticed that your um, amount that was budgeted uh, for in 2021 was exactly six percent of uh, your um, 2020 projection for net. Uh, patient revenue and FFP, but now that you're you've got some uh, you know favorable wind at your back at, as as you begin to land at, at the end of the fiscal year, yeah. that uh, 2020 number is going to go up a bit. And I'm just wondering what the process is to fine tune that number relative to um, you know the end amount that you actually pay in tax. So the end amount we're going to eventually pay in tax will be our actual fiscal 2020 net patient revenue. So. Um, that's a, a moving target, but based on our reprojections, uh, the budgeted provided tax is actually a little bit low, about one hundred fifty thousand yep. dollars. Yeah. So you so you don't know uh, what the exact amount is going to be in your twenty twenty one budget until the fiscal year twenty twenty is cooked. Correct. Typically, typically there's a reconciliation once the fiscal year is done. Uh, the provided tax gets adjusted to the actual results for the. Yep. Prior year, so in this case, okay. our 2021 provided tax will be based on our actual 2020 net patient. Right, rate. right. Um, looking at the just the, the payer mix issue, and uh, uh, I appreciate uh, you know that uh, you know Diva has come out and said there's not going to be any Medicaid rate increases in in 2021, but I'm I'm just looking at your growth in Medicaid um, is 29.2% uh, um, over. Uh, you know, the 2021 uh, uh, payer mix number is 29.2% over uh, 2020 budget and 15.5% over uh, 2020 uh, projected. So um, those, so, so if those are all volume based, they, they seem pretty rich. So they're not all volume based. Um, a couple things to, to contribute to that. Uh, one is uh, under our ACO program, there's been an, an increase in the attributed lives, so that uh, uh, that's right. payment has gone up. Um, and the other is we are building into the budget um, a slight increase in Medicaid due to the economic downturn created by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, things aren't as good as they used to be. Empl uh, employment's not as good as it used to be. Uh, so we did anticipate that there may be an increase in those coming onto the Medicaid um, program. That's right. I, I forgot that you were the lead dogs on this your revised way of uh, uh, calculating attribution. Um, so um, just thinking a little bit about last time we met, I forget whether it was up there or here, uh, you talked about the relationship with Littleton Hospital and that uh, you felt some of that market share was coming back to you. Uh, I'm wondering just how through this COVID experience, uh, you and Littleton uh, collaborated, didn't collaborate, uh, you know, what, what, what that experience was like. Sure, they reached out to us recently. Actually, Sean, do you want to talk about uh, 
Sure. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, early on we we're still very much operating in a bubble, uh, you know, struggling to cope with uh, the challenges we had internally. But just in the last month and a half, uh, we've uh, developed a, a collaborative working relationship. The leadership teams have gotten together now a couple of times and uh, we're, we're, we're exploring ways to, to improve collaboration and partnership, one of which you've already heard about, which is the ophthalmologist, and how do we work together to keep that ophthalmologist in our respective mm -hmm. communities. Um, but there are some other opportunities that we're also exploring around uh, ENT or uh, even uh, ortho and emergency ortho services. So I, I anticipate, like I mentioned to you earlier, I think one thing that we've seen is that uh, we've always had a strength in, in developing strong partnering relationships. And uh, if anything, COVID has brought us all closer together than not. Mm -hmm. And my final question is uh, around this, uh, around infusion therapy. I mean, it's a big number. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is the volume risk around that? I mean, it's, uh, I don't know the amount that you're paying, whether that's one patient or two patients, but, uh, but if there's a, uh, an addition or a subtract, subtraction of, of a patient and uh, getting, getting that service, it's significant. So I'm wondering, you know, what the volume risk is, is, uh, you know, around that. Well, sure, it, it is one patient. It's one patient, um, $26,000 of drug cost every two weeks. So if, if that patient uh, is not get that service anymore, our expenses would go down and our revenue would go down by the same amount. It's we're just basically mm -hmm. covering our cost. Mm -hmm. But so, but do you have any kind of like sense of, of what that, um, disease is in the community that is, a, is it a high risk that another person could show up or very low risk? I would just be careful about uh, any HIPAA. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, I can't, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I can't get into a lot of details, but it, it is not a community communicable disease. That, that. I was just wondering about the demographics, but um, so that's, it, that's my last when question. When you have, yeah, N equals one, it's very hard to uh, speak uh, directly to that. I will say, though, that that's an example of the challenges we, we have with the system. You know, that's one patient with a particular condition that needs a particular drug. That could happen, you know, it's, it's a roll of the dice. You could have a completely different person with a completely different um, need and a very expensive drug that's going to impact your, 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 your NPR numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Next is board member Yusufer, Maureen. Uh, thanks, and um, also want to echo the thanks for everything you've been doing during the pandemic. Um, and uh, also echo Jess's comment on your presentation. It was very straightforward. I really appreciated all the bridges that you put in here. The cost savings, you're one of the only hospitals that actually has lined out that the cost savings on the chart. And I keep asking about it every year and I've been asking every hospital and, and you did uh, put that in. We, and did, also, a few, we you know, did a few more. Details, details on your cash flow. So that's been um, very helpful. Um, I don't know if it's possible to bring the presentation back up because I do have a bunch of questions um, on the financial statements. It might yeah, be a little easier. Um, I know that. I know yeah. Bob was sharing before, and I know you're yes. just. Uh, I, I don't think I can. Okay. Let me try to. Back. I think I might have it up here. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, Laura's going to try and do it. Okay. Did you have another question while she brings it up? Um, a lot of my questions are going to go through, you know, are going through kind of some of the financial statements, but I'll, I'll start with when you go, when we would be on slide 10, which is the income statement. And I'm going back to kind of 2019 as, you know, the, the base year since 2020, obviously there was a lot of fluctuation on what happened. But when you look at the salary fringe line in 2019, it was 50 million. Your 2020 budget was 56 million. Your 20 projection is 60 million and your 21 budget is 63 million. So there's been a, huge increase across that line from um, 2019 to the 21 budget and, and there was a big jump that occurred in the 20 projection so really just trying to get a handle on it it, it looks like some of it might have come out of other operating expense which there was a reduction so trying to see one were there any re reclassifications and what you were looking at between 19 and 
And where you're going, 21? Yes. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. So uh, what happens is um, we've reclassed the travelers. Traveler expense used to be other operating expense. Uh, okay. And now it's, it's considered part of the salary budget. Um, so that's a big chunk of, of, of what's going on there. It's, so it's like 1.6 million in 2021 for travel expenses. In, in 2019, that was included as other operating expenses. Okay, there's still a pretty big swing there, you know, from going from 50 to 63 yep. um, year over year. And I know you brought up some of the salary increases, but you cut FTEs, you know, you had cost savings in that line. So I was just yeah. having a hard time. Maybe you can follow up on I that. I will, yeah, 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 I will, Maureen, yep. Okay, uh, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, you also went down $6 million in your other operating expense, so it, it could be... Um, there's something no, else. Don't. Yeah, from 50 to 56. Yeah, but. There's something else. We'll get that for you. Okay. Um, and then I also also wanted to talk about the COVID-related expense. And on slide, um, on slide 17, you had the incremental COVID-related expenses 415 that went from the 20 budget to the, to the 21 projection. But on the following slide, when you went from the 20 budget to the 21 budget, the COVID-related expense was 1.1 million. So, um, you know, there, obviously there may be expenses that there were expenses in the 2020 forecast. And, you know, I think the cleaner way to look at it is background. But I think the cleaner way to look at it is probably the 20 budget. I'm echoing. So. Um, you're, 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 talk about breaking up a, you're breaking up a bit, but I, I think I get the gist of your question. So if you look at slide 17, slide 17 you'd have to add the 722000 and the 415000 under 20 yeah. to 21 yeah. projection. So those two together are the $1.1 million. So if you're just going from 20 budget to 21 budget, it's just that one number, the $1.1 million for COVID-related expenses. So then so that goes back to the commercial rate increase. I think I'm I echoing think you, and you, you might have to mute when I'm talking. Yeah, and I, I, you, you're breaking up as you're, you're asking the question, at least uh, on, on my computer here. Yeah, yeah. so the 1.1 million looks to be the change from 20 budget to 21. And if we then look at your commercial rate increase, um, that would almost be the entire commercial rate increase related to the incremental piece. Yeah, again, you're breaking up. I think I get just to the question again. So the 1.1 million of COVID related expenses, some of that is for laboratory testing uh, and we get the revenue for that. So we're not looking for any rate increase uh, to cover what we're getting reimbursed by the insurance companies for the portion of the expenses related to lab testing. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Um, the next would be on the balance sheet. Um, when you talk about the ACO risk reserve settlement payable, and in 20 projection, you had 1.1 million, and in 20 budget, you have 1.7 million, and then you also talked about early in your um, write-up a uh, 600,000 reserve for the ACO. And really just trying to understand what do you have on the balance sheet for the ACO from 2019, 2020, and then 21. Yeah. Um, so so the, the total uh, that you see there, the 1.7 million is for three years. So that's the fiscal uh, the plan year 2019 year 20 and 2021. Uh, at some point, likely we'll have to pay at least the plain year 19 piece of that, uh, which is about $543,000. Um, but you know, I, I'm not sure when that payment's going to be made. So the way it stands right now, all three years is still showing up as a liability on the balance sheet. Okay. And as far as you know, in 2019, you think you're going to owe about 543 and what would you have accrued for 2019? 
uh, this is when it, what we ended up accruing. Yeah. Okay. And then I mean, for 2020, just, you're kind of estimating, are you, are you accruing a hundred percent of your liability? It's like 95% of our projected liability. Yeah. yeah. And 600,000 is for the fiscal year 2021 piece of the risk. And that is at a hundred percent. Right. Okay. We can see that. And I mean, obviously we hope at some point you're not incurring a hundred percent risk each year yep. and that, it, you know, you would just have to, what we are seeing with some of the hospitals now is just a tweaking of that budget year over year as they kind of look to reconcile that it won't be maybe a hundred percent in 20. Um, so we're hoping maybe there's some favorability there because of the usage, right? And then now you're putting on a full for 21. So we're hoping and, and we're assuming that that might happen. But, you know, I, I, again, I'm just a, a little conservative by nature. And um, until we have some better data, that's what we're going by. Right. Okay. Um, and then when you talked about 340B, um, I believe you had. Um, $4 million dollars um, in, in, in one number you talked about in 340B and then a million five. I mean, what is the, what do you think your contribution? So your revenue less expenses is for 340B? So the, that really is on the um, other operating revenue side at 2.5 million or so. And that is net of expenses. Uh, four million. So the four million. So there's two pieces to 340B. One is the savings we get for our outpatient drug purchases, except yeah. for Medicaid patients. Um, so you know that's just we don't have a lot of expenses related to that. It's just uh, our pharmacy director does a great job of making sure we're getting all the 340B savings as we can. But there's no other costs associated with getting those savings. The other operating revenue, the uh, two and a half million again uh, in round numbers is net of the drug costs that we incur to for that program. Okay. And net of the fees that we pay to the pharmacies for dispensing the drugs. So that's but the 475, that's a change from 20 budget, 20 projection to 21 budget, I think in the other operating chart, and then there was a negative 400. I, you know, just, I guess at the end of the day, for getting the bridge charts for, for this part, you know, yeah. what's revenue less expenses and, yeah, so uh, again, the bridge part is is not accurate because of the reprojections. But again, I guess the the answer is that all of the expenses associated with the 340B program are netted out, and the, the growth is on a net basis. Okay. Um, okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Sure. Kevin, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, Maureen. <laughs> um, I just want to start out uh, with a big thank you to the whole team at uh, at your uh, hospital. And basically, um, you know, it's very evident when we've been there, we've seen true community involvement. We've seen a real sense of collaboration. And I think that uh, it was a major step this year to... Um, here that you're even reaching out across the border. In the past, it seemed to be more competitive in nature with Littleton. And I think uh, by having conversations with Littleton in North Country, um, NVRH is really um, taking the lead in trying to figure out how best to provide access to members of the community and really expanding what, what is the community to others' HSAs as well. So thank you for that. And uh, we're very glad to hear that uh, um, you appear to be solving that access problem when it comes to ophthalmology. Um, were you able to apply for any FEMA grants? At, at this point, we've not decided to apply for any FEMA grants, Kevin, for the, for the same reason. I mean, we f think we've already received more than cash and we're going to be able to support. Um, so if we got any FEMA grants, my concern is we just have to pay them back. Okay. Well, one of the things I was thinking, Bob, is... I'm not sure if it was you or Sean or who, but somebody spoke about the uh, real necessity to have good testing. And one of the things that we've seen in Vermont is many hospitals have not been able to have good testing. Mm -hmm. And when when the testing is there, the, the time lag has been problematic. And I didn't know if you had looked into um, 
purchasing any equipment that would give a faster turnaround and that you would yeah. be so guaranteed I, access to yeah. uh, supplies. Yeah. Sure, we yeah, do. That, John, John, actually, yeah, yeah, we um, we've been paying close attention to this, and it's a real challenge. We actually, um, just as COVID started to ramp up, actually the conversation started. We had a very uh, generous donor in our larger community came to us and asked what our needs might be, and one of the big needs on our list is a high-end uh, lab analyzer. It's called a. I think we ended up with a Cepheid. And the uh, donor said, yeah, we're going to help support you get that. And they did. Um, we put the order in in early March. And because there was such a back order on those devices, I don't think we got it until July and actually just got it up running. But that's only half the battle. Um, it's The challenge now is getting these, they're called pods, which are the, which are the, essentially the medium in which the test is performed. So we have this beautiful new piece of lab equipment in our lab, but we don't have and cannot get the medium in order to do the immediate testing that we really need. And my understanding is regardless of the type of equipment you buy, that is a challenge for the entire healthcare system. Uh, word is that we may start getting that medium uh, maybe as early as December, uh, but it, your guess is as good as mine. It really comes down to the supply chain issues that we have. Um, we're really hopeful for that because having that on-site testing would be transformative to us. It, it will make a huge difference in our ability to care for our patients. With the, the machine that you bought, what is the turnaround on the test, Sean? Boy, half an hour, 45 minutes, right, Mike? Yeah, 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And that makes it that so makes much it better, better for your for your, your care. care. You yes. can get yeah. the results yeah. quicker. So, um, so um, yeah. you know, we we continue to hear from others as well that uh, the the media sepian kits are are really tough to acquire, and uh, we just hope that uh, as more people um, in the production area see the the huge opportunities that are available, that more production will occur and. That will be a, a great help for you and many others in Vermont. So, definitely. definitely. Yep. So, um, with that, I really don't have any other questions. The board members have really done a good job of uh, grilling you, and uh, your presentation was uh, very good. So, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate. And I'm not sure, I didn't see Mike on the line, but I did see Eric and Julia. Who will be doing the questioning today? I'll be doing the questioning. Uh, Great, Kevin. thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, one indicator of um, kind of the efficacy of the free care policy that we've been looking at is the uh, uh, amount of free care relative to bad debt and NVRH has over the last two years um, performed really well on that metric. Um, in 2020 budget, um, you guys were the second highest um, provider of free care relative to bad debt in the state. On 2021, uh, fourth in both years, you guys were the highest um, in terms of critical access hospitals. Um, in talking with other hospitals, what we've seen is a lot of times when that ratio is really high that organizations have a bunch of organizational processes that are enabling people to get free care. So for instance, screening people when they come in and then actually having staff go to the bed and making sure, say for instance, that a child who's born gets on quickly onto Medicaid. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about some of these organizational facts that aren't necessarily evident in the written FAP that you feel are um, critical in getting the appropriate uh, financial supports to your consumers. Sure, yeah, uh, we don't go to the bedside um, unless a patient asks, you know, if a patient says, I don't have insurance, I'd like to talk to a counselor. Um, we try not to get into the clinical areas, um, mm -hmm. but we do everything we can. Once the patient gets a bill, you know, it's very clear on there. Um, please call if you feel you need help paying your bill or you can't pay your bill. Uh, and we make every effort. So 
we try and reach out to patients, and we try, we do reach out to patients, try and get them on Medicaid first, uh, and if they're not eligible to get on Medicaid, work with them diligently to get them to qualify for our free care program. We have a very talented person uh, who's supported by others, but the person that uh, is most involved with that does a great job um, helping people apply wherever she can. And, uh, and it shows, I think, uh, in, in the numbers. I also would like to stress, uh, it's not just what we do here at the hospital that impacts that. Um, mm -hmm. We have great uh, relationships with our human services uh, and social services partners within the community. We have our own department here in Community Connections, uh, Northeast Community Action, uh, the uh, AAA, uh, you know, the Council on Aging. Um, and uh, those partners, Umbrella, right here, helping uh, you know women who are struggling, and all of those partners really work together well to ensure that um, the members of our community are receiving, getting the access they need to uh, health insurance or other services as necessary, and that really helps overall. Yeah, that's a great point. It is a community effort. Well, it does really come through in the numbers and it's much appreciated. Um, and I just wanted to ask one last question about the actual reduction in the overall number of uh, free care dollars for 2021B. I mean, is that due to increase in Medicaid or what's driving that? I think part of that, Eric, yeah, I think that's part of the what's driving that. Um, so our Medicaid numbers have gone up a bit and I think uh, it's uh, one of the reasons why the uncompensated care has gone down a bit. Well, that's all we have. Thank I want to echo everyone's voices on this. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. And I know I can only speak from experience. The messages uh, coming out of my local community hospital have really added to my mental sanity in this period when there's a lot of noise. And it's wonderful to trust your local providers. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So now we're going to move to public comment. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment on the NVRH budget? So hearing none, um, once again, I want to thank uh, everyone at NVRH um, for um, the dialogue this morning. And uh, again, um, echo the thanks that everyone has offered on the excellent work on um, addressing, um, really ramping up for what we expected to be a much larger um, hit from COVID. But really also, I think that uh, it's a testament to what you're doing, that you are over 100% again, because your community has confidence that when they go to your institution, they're going to be safe. And so uh, keep up the great work. Um, we are going to go into recess to 1025, and at that time, we will take up Northwest Medical Center. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your morning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.